injustice, see no evil. Uh, two weeks ago, the last time we talked on this series, uh, Amy taught, and our bottom line was serving starts with seeing. Before we continue, I feel like you guys are a mile away. Can we have everybody like, pull up into the first front two rows? Uh, you might look around and be like, where is everybody? Uh, it's, a, it's a holiday week, and so uh, we're glad that we're here. We're glad we didn't cancel or else none of us would be together. So we're going to have like a little just more fun, smaller environment with just us, and um, we're still going to have a great party afterwards. So we're glad you guys are here. we got some room on this side too late if you can't find that side. There we go. That's, that's much better. I don't feel like you guys are so far away. All right. So uh, Amy talked two weeks ago. Our bottom line was serving starts. With seeing last week uh, was Summer Camp 19 recap. We had three students on the stage with Amy and I helping us teach our, our bottom lines for Summer Camp 19. Part of the big stuff. Who was here last week for that? Uh, yeah, that was awesome. That was awesome. Um, and as you heard, uh, I will be actually flying out to Tanzania this Saturday along with our new leader, Olivia Diebold, who's not here tonight because she's sick, as you heard during the prayer request. Um, and uh, and so uh, we'll be flying out, so please pray for safety and that God uses mightily uh, in Africa. Um, after I get back, um, I will be uh, going on vacation. So it's going to be a few weeks till I'm back here with you guys on Wednesday nights, but we will still have normal services. All of our amazing leaders, it's here for our amazing leaders. Because of them, can actually leave and know that leaving you guys in safe hands and cable hands, I don't have to worry about when I'm half a world away about what's going on here because I know uh, they got you. They'll take care of you guys. And, and uh, Amy will be in charge, so if you have any questions, you can, you can ask Amy. They will all be here uh, when I'm gone in my absence. Uh, next week, you guys have a special treat. My good fellow youth pastor friend, Brian Colligan. Uh, from Wood Creek Church will be guest speaking here in two weeks. Amy will be teaching again. And in three weeks, another friend of mine from Wood Creek, uh, Katie Cave, will be here guest speaking. And in four weeks is Hurricane Harbor Day, so I hope to see you there. And Amy and I will be there, so we want to hang out with you and have a fun day. We won't have any service that night, so we'll be there all day. Uh, just hang out. If you're not signed up for that, remember, Amy said the deadline's just a little over a week away, so you can sign up tonight. All right. Uh, if you have not heard yet, uh, Pastor Noah has left Five Stone to take a position at another church, and we're really, really excited for him, but uh, this is going to seriously affect our student worship team because Pastor Noah basically ran everything. So that's definitely going to affect us uh, this summer. Uh, because I'm gone most of July, it's going to take a few weeks to kind of pick up all the pieces of, of Noah leaving. Um, but we're going to have to have a worship team, our student worship team, take a break for a few weeks while we kind of figure out uh, the future um, of uh, Five Stone students' worship. And so um, they will be back, promise. And so um, I've already started talking with uh, potential new adult uh, volunteer leaders of our student worship team. And so um, once we get the new leaders on board and trained and all set, uh, the live worship team will return, I promise, uh, hopefully next month sometime in August. And in the meantime, we'll continue using uh, the worship lyric videos like we did tonight. So thank you for your patience in the midst of this uh, difficult season of change, I think it's fair to say. All right. So, see no evil. We are continuing this series on injustice. So let's get started with a question. Um, do you guys ever get annoyed with all the rules that you're expected to follow as students? Anyone? Anybody get annoyed with all the rules at home, at school, everywhere else you go as a teenager or a middle schooler that you have to follow? Yeah, obviously, right? Yeah. You have about a million different things that people are telling you to do, and you're supposed to keep, be able to keep track of it all perfectly, right? And even though we all know a lot of those rules are for our good, it doesn't change the fact that rules can just get under our skin, right? But you know what's worse than someone telling you what to do? It's someone telling you what to do that doesn't actually practice what they preach. Uh, those people that tell you what to do and they don't actually do what they're telling you to do. It's the worst, right? Uh, <laughs> Uh, your mom, here's some examples. Your mom, if you're a high schooler and you drive, tells you not to speed in the car, yet 
You know she set a land speed record a few weeks ago when she dropped you off for soccer practice so that she could get back in time to watch the voice for them. Or your older sister tells you to make wise choices with guys, only to find out later that she's been dating the guy with the worst reputation at school. Or your best friend decides to lecture you on what you did last Friday night, only to turn around next Friday night and make a bunch of bad decisions of their own. It's so annoying, right, when people do that? Because when people place a rule on you that they don't actually follow themselves, it's being what? What are they, what are they being? Yeah, hypocritical. And a hypocrite is someone who judges you for doing something they also do. When you see somebody who's a hypocrite, how does it make you feel? Annoyed? Frustrated? Put off? Yeah, generally mad. The thing about hypocrites is not only are they annoying, but more importantly, they're not effective. Think about it. When someone holds you to a standard you know that they aren't holding themselves to, does that make you want to follow them and, and do what they tell you? No. Does it make you want to listen to them? Follow them? Trust them? No, not even a little bit. See, they lost their effectiveness because they didn't take their own advice. Do you know what else is usually true about hypocrites? In general, they don't usually know that they are a hypocrite. Most people who treat other people this way don't see that they're actually doing it. So what does this all have to do with injustice? Well, two weeks ago, Amy said, one way we can start to respond to the injustice in our world is by praying a simple prayer. God, open my eyes. And hopefully a lot of you did just that. Maybe for the first time you started looking out for the injustice around you, in your world. And if you did, that's great. But as your eyes open, chances are you probably started seeing and thinking about the people actually causing the injustice evil that we see in our world, like the people that are actually causing it, the people behind what we see. For instance, the corrupt leaders in countries who oppress their people, or the evil people who operate the sex trafficking industry, the unethical managers who use children as laborers, the racist people who ignore or hurt those who simply don't look like them. The despicable people who profit from the abortion industry. The bullies who do awful things to people at your school. You see, when you open your eyes to the evil or injustice around you, you also see the people behind the injustice, the people causing that injustice. And I think that's probably true for all of us. When someone starts talking about injustice, we tend to start thinking of people who are making that injustice happen. We think about how bad they are, how wrong they are, and how someone should stop them. We think about the punishment they deserve. We think because if we could just stop all the bad people in the world, the people who hurt, oppress, or take advantage of other people, then we'd solve all the problems of the justice in the world, right? And this is where the hypocrites come in. So I got some bad news for all of us in this room. This is where I think we've all become hypocrites. I think that when it comes to injustice, we're all a little bit hypocritical, if we're being honest. And we don't even know it. Let me explain. I'm not saying we're doing things as terrible as people on the news who are oppressing people 
or selling little kids. But what I am saying is, I think, if we're being honest, we could all admit we sometimes hold other people to a standard of right and wrong that we don't apply to ourselves. Sure, we can point out the wrongs we see other people committing in our school, but have we ever stopped to wonder if we're possibly guilty of the same things they are? Think about it. You know the guy at your school who destroys, utterly just destroys other guys at school, and every chance you get to talk about him, you, know, you tell everybody what a jerk he is. But then when you go to your house, you easily get annoyed by your siblings, make fun of them, maybe make fun of your stepdad. Or maybe you're repeating a rumor about what that girl said at the party, and you're saying to yourself, I can't believe she'd say that. But if you actually went through your Instagram DM and looked at what you sent other people, you would see a lot of those same comments that you've made about others. Maybe you see that guy who comes to small group or on Wednesday night at five some students every week, and you're like, I see him at school or on the sports team, whatever it is. I've seen how he acts when he's not at church. And the way he acts is not how a Christian should act. Do you ever stop and think about the ways your words, actions, and choices may fall into that very same category? Which is called all these attitudes and behaviors what they are. Hypocritical. And look, we're all guilty of it. We're all in the same boat. We're all guilty of looking at and pointing out the injustice in other people, but ignoring it in ourselves. And remember what we said about people like that? Which also includes people like us, by the way. Those people are not fun to be around. Which means that we may not always be fun to be around. You ever thought of that? Sometimes, maybe when you're with your friends, you're not that fun to be around. We may not be effective in influencing people the way we want to because of that. We may not be representing the church the way we want to. But there is good news here. Jesus gave us a solution to this variation. I think the solution not only helps us better respond to the injustice around us, but the injustice happening in us. As well. Tonight we're going to look at the book of Matthew, which is one of the four Gospels of Jesus Christ, which record Jesus' three years here on this earth. And they were either they were all either written by someone who was an eyewitness of Jesus' life here, or someone who interviewed an eyewitness. And Matthew was one of Jesus' closest followers, one of his 12 disciples who followed Jesus around for three years. He learned from him. He knew him. Tonight's passage comes from one of Jesus' most famous messages known as the Sermon on the Mount. Pretty sure you've ever heard of the Sermon on the Mount. Very famous message of Jesus. A lot of people believe that Jesus gave different versions of the Sermon on the Mount at different times in his life. In fact, the stuff he said here was so critical to the bigger message he taught in his life that he made to circle back to the same message over and over again, which should tell us that Jesus was saying, hey guys, this is really important. You need to get this. And in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus specifically addressed injustice. And here's what he said in uh, Matthew 5, 21. You have heard that our ancestors were told, you must not murder. If you commit murder... You are subject to judgment. Pause there. This is pretty standard stuff for Jesus, right? Um, 2,000 years ago, it's probably very unlikely that anyone in Jesus' audience would have had a problem with saying, yeah, murder is not good. Yeah, everybody would pretty much be tracking with what Jesus was saying here. Pretty standard stuff. But then, 
Jesus said this, verse 22. But I say, if you are even angry with someone, you are subject to judgment. Wait, what? We went from murder to angry? Uh, that's, that was probably a little harder to believe for Jesus' audience. Is Jesus really equating anger with murder? What? I don't know about you, but I've definitely been angry with other people in my life, like probably yesterday. I mean, we all have, right? And just to be clear, Jesus is basically saying when we're harsh with other people in our lives, he's basically saying we're going to receive the same judgment as those who commit murder. What? And Jesus keeps going. Verses 27 to 28. You have heard the commandment that says, you must not commit adultery. But I say, anyone who even looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. <laughs> so now Jesus is saying that just thinking sexual thoughts about someone is as bad as adultery. If you don't know what that is, that's basically having sex with someone that you're not married to. Uh, again, what? Just what is Jesus saying here? Now, when we hear the first half of those statements, murder and adultery, like, yeah, Jesus, we're tracking with those. Why do we, like, we're, like, nodding a lot of approval like probably Jesus' audience was 2,000 years ago? Why? Because we would never do those sins, right? We would never murder or commit adultery, right? We're confident that we wouldn't do that. So it's easy for us to see the injustice there. Murder, adultery, yeah, yeah. But the second half of those statements, <laughs> the ones that we actually do all the time, well, that's hard for us to see the injustice in those. Ah, those are so bad. Angry, a brother, I don't know if that's not really that good. Hmm. And that's what makes us hypocrites. Quick to judge someone for causing pain to someone else, but we tend to gloss over our own words, choices, and thoughts that also cause pain. What Jesus is saying here is that God isn't just considering our negative actions, He sees the intent behind the actions, which means that even if we don't actually do or say something negative to someone else, look what it says right here in the verses. Look, you have to say anything, any other action besides that. It's sin. It's on the same level as adultery. So you don't even have to actually do something physically, it can be just a thought. We still might have a heart with those bad thoughts and feelings in it. Even if there's no actual physical action, we don't actually physically hurt someone. Because the injustice is still there in us. Even though it wasn't expressed to someone else, we still have that judgment inside. If we want to be a generation that sees no evil, tolerates no evil, and stands up to injustice, then we can't just acknowledge it in other people. We have to acknowledge it in ourselves, too. We can't solve the problems of evil or injustice if we're harboring evil in our own hearts. In other words, we can't solve a problem that we're contributing to. Does that make sense? Like, oh, that's a terrible thing, but if we're contributing to it, we can't solve it. So where do we start? Well, thank goodness, Jesus has some thoughts on this, too. Let's check them out. How can you think of saying to your friend, let me help you get rid of that speck in your eye, when you can't see past the log in your own eye? Hypocrite! First, get rid of the log in your own eye, then you will see well enough to deal with the speck 
in your friend's eye. So I stopped at Lowe's yesterday to pick up some sermon props. So you guys know I like sermon props, so I'll illustrate my points. And so um, I've got some sawdust here. That's what that is. You can't tell what that is, sawdust. Have you ever got sawdust in your eye? That hurts. It scratches your recording. It's not fun. Yeah, it's not a fun thing. Very small, but it can really be painful. So what Jesus is saying here is that your friend got some sawdust, a speck of sawdust in his eye. And he's like, he's walking around with one eye. And he's like, ah, this is hurt. My eye's watering. It's all red and bloodshot. And this is like you as the friend walking up to him saying, hey, that's awful that you have that speck of sawdust in your eye. You better take care of that. Look, you're walking around with just with one eye squeezed shut. It's watering. Oh, that looks painful. However, at the time you're saying that, you have a log sticking out of your eye. And you're pointing out somebody else's problem, which is far, far less serious than his. His, his is far less serious than yours. You have a far more serious problem going on. You got a two by four sticking out of your eye. <laughs> That's a problem. That's, that's, a little different. that's a little difficult and dangerous. This is what Jesus is saying here. This is why he's saying, he's calling him a hypocrite. Like, why are you pointing at faults in others when you got a log, a plank, would stick it out of your own eye? Deal with your problem first before pointing out other people's problems. What does it all mean? Jesus is saying that we can tell someone, we, before we can tell someone else what they're doing wrong, we need to first look at ourselves. We can't see a problem in someone else's life and feel the freedom to point it out or to walk around with a giant plank of an issue in our own life. We want to be a generation that takes the speck of injustice out of other people must first address the planks that are in our own eyes. We can't see how to fix issues around us if we're not first want to fix ourselves with God's help. Before you can act on the just around you, pay attention to the injustice in you. That's our bottom line today. Pay attention injustice in you. Before you can act to the injustice around you, you've got to pay attention to the injustice in you. Go ahead and say that to your neighbor and if you take notes, you can write it down. Pay attention to the injustice in you. Pay attention to the injustice in you. That's exactly what I want all of us to try to do this week. Let's honestly examine the things in our own hearts that may contribute to injustice in our world. So for us, the big and small ways, we are a part of the problem. Maybe it's the words we use, the choices we make, or the thoughts we think, because in some ways, we're all guilty of injustice. Now, that may sting a little bit to hear, but the good news is that we're not without redemption. Because of Jesus, whatever hypocritical wrongs we may have committed, it can be made right. And that's great news, but just like doing something about injustice around us has to start with seeing, so does something about the injustice in us. You've got to pay attention to the injustice in you. It's hard as it can be to do. So this week, let's start by praying this simple prayer. You can pray right now quietly to yourself. God, help me see the injustice in me. Ask you to open your eyes to things in yourself. Things like hate for another person. Or hate for an entire group of people. Anger over something someone has done lustful habits that objectify other people or even supporting or visiting sites that promote that. If you're not tracking where I'm going here, I'm 
I'm talking about visiting important sites. Habits in school or home that exclude people or leave them out or treats them like they're not as important as you. The lack of compassion over the suffering of others in your world. Maybe it's harsh words that you've said about someone else or to someone else. When you ask God to help you see, he'll respond by opening your eyes. When he does, it can, it can hurt a bit at first. But the point of asking God to open your eyes isn't like to, to make you miserable or make yourself feel guilty. We can commit to taking just one step toward righting whatever wrongs that God shows you. Maybe it's as simple as changing your behavior, or maybe it's going, um, maybe it's just apologizing to someone. Maybe it's uh, going to require going to someone that you can trust and asking if you can be accountable to them. Whatever it is, ask God to help you see, then do something about the injustice in you. See and do. So that's your first step. Second practical step that we've been talking about in this series is maybe God is calling you to come serve on our urban mission trip that Amy talked about earlier. Serve Project DFW19. We're going to be partnering with seven great organizations all over DFW where you will get the opportunity to physically and tangibly see and be used by God to be the hands and feet of Jesus, to serve people in our community that are in need. Maybe you need to pray about that and see if that's what God's calling you to do. There's only a little over a week left to sign up for that. A couple weeks left to sign up for that. So I'd encourage you to start praying about that. Maybe you're like, I don't really know how to serve people. I don't know. I don't know. That's a great way. Come with us on our urban mission trip. You know, listen, I, I know this may sound crazy, but imagine for a second if we actually did this. I'm not talking about every Christian in the world. I'm talking about just people that are in this room right now. What if we address the injustice inside of us? What if we get people who saw those like Jesus and then actually treated them the way that he treated them? What would happen? How would that affect our church? How would that affect your school? What would change in your family? Remember, you've got to pay attention to the injustice in you because too much is at stake to go around for the rest of your life living as if we're never in the wrong. It's always other people's fault. God is calling us to be a generation that does something about injustice in His name. That includes the injustice in us. It's always easier to notice injustice in someone else, but we can't fix a problem outside of ourselves and ignore the problem that's part of us. Because once we get the planks out of our own eyes, I believe God is going to open our eyes in new ways to the specks of injustice all around us. We're going to have our leaders come and stand on the side of, of the aisles. If you're sitting here tonight and you're hearing about Christians and Jesus and most people in this in this room grew up in church, but we never make the assumption that that everyone has. And so we want to make sure that we give you the opportunity to make the most important decision of your life. And that involves the most important you who ever lived with Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us that we were created to be in a relation with God, but that sin messed everything up. And, and sin is sounds like a really big churchy world, but simply means falling short of God's standard. It means messing up. 
No one in this room is perfect. I'm not perfect. We're all in the same boat. We've all messed up. But the Bible says that the penalty for being a, a guilty sinner, which we all are, is death. And uh, in the Bible, the Bible talks about death. It, it doesn't just mean physical death. It means spiritual death. And spiritual death is far worse than physical death because spiritual death means spending eternity forever, completely alone, in isolation, pain, and suffering. In a place that the Bible calls hell. I'll tell you that to scare you. I'll tell you that because we love you and care about you. I think you're old enough to know the truth. I believe in hell because Jesus talked a lot about hell and he believed in it. The Bible is very clear on saying that is that's justice. That's where people who have not dealt with their sin problem, that's where you can spend eternity if they have never been dealt with their sin problem. I know that's kind of heavy, serious, but it's the truth. The thing is, people, some people think like, well, you know, how could a loving God send people to a place like that? The thing is, God doesn't send us there. We send ourselves there. Because people think they deserve to go to heaven, but actually no one actually deserves to go to heaven. I'm a pastor. Guess what? I don't deserve to go to heaven. No one does. So we talked about our sin problem that we're all in as guilty sinners, and then we talked about the, the penalty for being a guilty sinner, which is kind of leaving us in this kind of heavy moment right now, but the good news is God the Father devised a great rescue plan. It involved His own Son, Jesus Christ, who 2,000 years ago He sent to our planet to be born as a human. And Jesus Christ was born as fully God and fully man on the first Christmas. And he grew up and he lived a perfect sinless life. He was the only, only innocent human who never sinned. And he performed countless miracles proving that he was who he claimed to be, God's son. But as an adult, he chose to fulfill his mission that his father sent him here for. And that was to die a brutal, agonizing, humiliating death on a Roman cross. And he bled, he suffered, and he died for hours in agony. And he died for you. Why? Because he loves you. And he doesn't want you to spend any time separated from him. After his death, he was buried in a tomb, and for three days, he was dead. But on the third day, God the Father raised his son, Jesus Christ, from the dead, defeating Satan and death once and for all, and offering all of us a chance to escape our fate as guilty sinners before he ascended back to heaven, where today, 2,000 years later, Jesus is alive and reigns in glory at the right hand of God the Father in heaven. And he wants you to join him there someday, but you need to make a decision before you can go there. And so in a room this big, I want you guys to know that, yeah, I'm flying, uh, it's almost 24 hours, three different flights, all the way to Africa. Something could happen to me. I don't know. But I know one thing. I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid to die, because I know with 100% conviction that if I die, I'll be in the presence of Jesus in heaven. No doubt whatsoever. My question to you is this. If something were to happen to you tonight, and if you were to die, do you know where you'd spend eternity? decision you'll ever, most important question you'll ever ask, you'll ever ask them. Do you know where you're going to spend forever? If you're sitting here today and you're freaking out a little bit, I don't know, I don't really think about those kind of things in middle school. Please don't leave this room without knowing for sure where you'll spend the time. So how do you know? Well, we know it's not by because your parents are Christians. The Bible never talks about that. We know it's not from getting baptized or sprinkled with water. The Bible never says that water can wash away your sins. We know it's not about being a good person because none of us can be good enough to reach God's standard. That's what other world religions teach, but Christianity is different than saying that we can't save ourselves. We need to save them. So how do we get to heaven? How do we know where we'll spend eternity when we are in By placing your faith in Jesus Christ to be our Savior and accepting the work that He paid on the cross. Die for you. See, that cross was meant for you and for me, not for Jesus. He was innocent. He took the penalty that you deserved. Your 
sitting here right now and you're like, yes, that's right, I feel something going on in my heart. That's not my words. That's Jesus knocking on the door of your heart. But it's not going to kick the door and you've got to open it. And the way you open it is by praying something we call the sinner's prayer. It's not a magical incantation or anything like that. It's just a beautiful prayer of surrender. Opening your heart to Jesus and letting him save you. Go ahead, bow your heads, close your eyes. If you're sitting here today and you don't remember a time where you prayed that for yourself, not because a parent did it or a pastor did it, but for yourself. You don't remember a time where you prayed that for yourself, that it's my decision, my choice. And you want to know with 100% certainty that you belong to Jesus, that your eternity is secure. You want to know where you're going to go when you die. All you need to do is silently repeat the words I'm about to pray and mean them in your heart. Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner and that I need a Savior. Jesus, I believe that you died on the cross for my sin and were raised from the dead on the third day. And I accept you today as my personal Savior. Save me. Forgive me of my sin. Change me. And help me to live for you every day for the rest of my life. All eyes closed, no one looking around. I'm not going to embarrass anyone. We're not going to bring you on stage or clap or anything like that. All eyes closed, don't look around. But if you prayed that with me for the first time and you meant it, it was this first time, this is the first time it was your choice. You know what should be ashamed? Why don't you recognize that this is the most important decision you'll ever make, more important than where you go to high school, where you go to college, what major you'll have in college, what job you'll have until even more important than who you marry. It's the decision you just made tonight. Here at After Party, Red, White, and Blue Edition, is the only decision you'll ever make that'll last in this life and the next. So if you pray that with me, all eyes closed, no one look around. Would you raise your hand with me in the count of three? No one look around. Ready? One, two. Anybody else? You're going to feel tap on your shoulder, that's just a meter. Just go with them, they're going to just talk to you outside real quick. Don't want to look around, I suppose. Heavenly Father, I thank you for these uh, two young men that uh, just raised their hands. Lord, I don't know their heart. I don't know if they if they uh, meant the words that they prayed, but you do, Lord. Uh, and so, Lord, I just pray that these were uh, genuine first-time decisions for you, that they're uh, lifelong decisions for you, that they uh, start living for you for the rest of their life, and they don't fall away like so many young people do, but they get plugged in either here or in their youth ministry with a growing community in a small group and accountability and start growing and learning about you through reading your, your word and Praying. Um, Lord, I pray that it's a life changing decision for you that this is the first day of the rest of their life walking with you, <clears throat> that their life is never the same, and that they'll remember this moment for the rest of their life. And, uh, Lord, last I pray that it's a world changing decision for you that they uh, now know the cure for the world's number one problem, which is sin, and I pray that they don't keep it for themselves, but they share it for everybody in their community, whether it's at home or their neighbors or next fall at school, wherever it is, Lord, that you would use them as missionaries in their world that you've placed them, Lord. Uh, thank you for this night. Thank you to the students that are here. Uh, Lord, we know that you've drawn every single one of these students here for a purpose uh, to hear this message. Please help them to apply to their lives. Lord, I pray for D groups and then later with the after party. Just please bless and protect us all. Uh, and I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Leaders, uh, if you can come to the front right here, uh, we're going to transition to D groups. Give you guys a few minutes and kind of break down the message in a small group atmosphere. Um, grade six to nine girls, uh, you are either with Amy or them. So grade six to nine girls. Grade six to nine boys, you're either with, uh, you can be with me because Ben's outside, so grade six to nine guys are with me. Uh, grade 10 to 12 girls, uh, you are with Donna, and yeah. Emma is here. You are with Donna or Emma. And grade 10 to 12 guys, you are with, Ryan's outside, so grade 10 to 12 guys, you're with Heath. All right, you got to the ski groups. Woo!